Happy Monday to you. Welcome back to the front porch. So thank you so much for joining in and so many of you who who watch these Monday meditations regularly and you give your comments and your feedback and you appreciate this time of Bible study. I, I hope you're enjoying it as much as I am and I appreciate so much the, the kind comments and responses that we've received throughout the time that we've been doing these videos. We're wanting to spend time though and the whole focus on this is spending time with God's Word. Just taking a little break and, and focusing on what God has to say. In, in the past few months, we've been looking at the book of Proverbs, and we're in Proverbs chapter 17. Today, we're going to be looking at verses 9 through 16 and gleaning a little more wisdom from the wisdom literature, from the Proverbs letter. And Solomon, in all of his wisdom that God gave him, took that inspiration and that wisdom and put it in ink and pen and Put this down for a son to learn, but also to hand down from generation to generation. It's the Word of God. God wants us to know these messages. And so what's he talking about in this passage we're going to look at today? Well, let's go ahead and begin. Psalm, or Proverbs, rather, chapter 17, verse 9 says, He that covereth a transgression seeketh love, but he that repeateth a matter separateth very friends. He that covereth a matter, not sweeps it under the rug or acts like it didn't happen, is someone who's willing to forgive, to help someone out of that transgression, to help it be covered, covered with the blood, as we know in the New Testament, means a forgiveness of sins, that God pardons us from those things. But there's that other side of that, the one who goes around wagging his tongue, so to say, the one who can't wait to tell everybody else, do you know what so-and-so did? Gossip, the, the backbiter, the one who's always harping on the wrongs that have been forgiven? That's a dangerous relationship. He separates very friends or he separates close friends even. Verse 10 says, A reproof entereth more into a wise man than an hundred stripes into a fool. Very common sense statement here when you look at it. A wise person is going to listen to the correction. A wise person is going to act upon that correction, the reproof that comes their way. This was wrong. You can't do that. They're going to make it right. But you can beat a fool a hundred times, a hundred stripes. It's not going to cause them to stop being a fool. It's not going to change their actions. Because if they change their actions and they listen to the reproof, if one lash, if a hundred lashes, if 99 lashes made the difference and they repented, they wouldn't be a fool anymore. They would be a wise person who listened to the reproof. But he says a fool's not going to going to continue in their foolishness. They'll blame the stripes. They'll blame the punishment instead of blaming the actual cause of the problem themselves being a fool. Verse 11 says, An evil man seeketh only rebellion. Therefore, a cruel messenger shall be sent against him. An evil man seeks to rebel against authority. Doesn't like being told what to do. Doesn't like to be corrected when they're wrong. He's like the fool we talked about earlier. But he goes on and he says that if you continue in that rebellious and evil state, a wicked state, there's going to be a cruel messenger shall be sent against him. Very similar to that of a merciless edict coming down from a king off with his head. He con he's gone against the law. He's transgressed the law. He's committed this crime, and this is his sentence. The judge banging his gavel saying, guilty. This is the idea of what we have to look forward to if we're this evil person who's seeking only rebellion. And then in verse 12 he says, Let a bear robbed of her whelps or cubs meet a man rather than a fool in his folly. It's, it's better to, to come against a bear who's lost her cubs. The mother bear is a dangerous beast, and especially if she's trying to find out who's harming her cubs. and You don't want to be in that situation, but it's better to meet a bear in that situation than to meet up with a fool in the midst of his folly. Now, that doesn't seem logical to us. That bear can rend you into pieces, can take your life. It's true. Well, what about the fool in the midst of his folly? Well, his in the midst of his foolishness and his sinfulness, he's hurting himself, his soul, but he's also hurting others and the influence that he's having on them. It's the idea of being or succumbing to that influence of that fool in the midst of their folly. It's better to come against a bear who's lost her cubs. That's how serious foolishness is in the eyes of God. 
we need to be more sober, be more sober-minded, be more focused on doing what God wants us to do. It doesn't mean you don't have fun and enjoy life. That's, that's not the idea. The foolishness of sin, and in the midst of that, it leads to destruction in the, from the presence of the Lord, from the glory of His power. He goes on then in verse number 13, it says, Whoso rewardeth evil for good, evil shall not depart from his house. Whoso rewards evil for good, that's a sad situation, isn't it? One commentary commentator made this statement, which was quite fascinating, and I think it's fitting to this. To render good for evil is divine. To render good for good is human. To render evil for evil is brutish. And to render good for evil is devilish. When we try to return good or give good to someone who is doing evil, we're, we're walking as God would have us to walk. Loving our enemies, doing good to them that hate us, doing, praying for them that persecute us and spitefully use us and all of those things. That's, that's Christianity. That's being more like God. When we render good for good, what reward have you? That's the easy thing to do. When you render evil for evil, that's just being a brute. No. But if you render good, if you render evil for good, you're being more like the devil. You're walking in the ways of sin. You're encouraging others to stop doing good and to start doing evil. And so he says, evil is not going to depart from his house. You remember what happened to David because of his actions. Remember, like, as you continue throughout his life, the hardships that befell him, often because of the sins that he had committed. The sword would not depart from his house. Verse 14 says, The beginning of strife is as when one letteth out water. Therefore, leave off contention before it be meddled with. The beginning of strife, he says, is like when you're letting out a little water. When you see the little bit of a seepage, water's going to make its way out. Water's going to find a way to get out. But sometimes that little leak turns into a bigger leak that turns into a gully washer, as the old saying goes, like the breaking of a levee of a dam. That water, you can't get it back in. And so he says the beginning of strife is like a little coming out. It's going to spread. It's going to continue to grow, and you can't get it back. So therefore, he says, leave off contention. Stop it before it ever starts, before it's ever meddled with. Good advice for all of us. We don't want to be strive causing people. We're to be peacemakers. We're to be of the same mind, the same judgment. Be no divisions among us, 1 Corinthians 1, verse 10 and following. He goes on then in verse 15 says, He that justifieth the wicked and he that condemneth the just, even they both are an abomination to the Lord. Similar to what we just read back in verse 13. Very similar to giving uh, good for evil, or evil for good rather. The idea of this with God is an abomination. He loathes that. He can't stand to see someone trying to justify wickedness, to put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Call that which is good evil and that which is evil good. He's the one who condemns the just as well. When you bring accusations against someone, especially someone who is one of God's children, who's been sanctified, who's been justified, he calls that abomination. And then in verse 16, Wherefore then is the price in the hand of a fool to get wisdom, seeing he hath no heart in it? Where does he pay the price? Why would a fool have the price for wisdom in his hand? It doesn't fit. You see, the price of wisdom is the fear of the Lord. It's the beginning of wisdom. And the fool doesn't have that. His heart's not in it. We're to love the Lord our God with all of our heart, with all of our soul, with all of our mind, with all of our strength, every ounce of our being. We're to seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things will be added unto us. Matthew 6, verse 33. We're told to serve Him with all of our hearts, to give our hearts over to Him. If it's not from the heart, where is it from? When we think about those things, it's easy to see why the price for wisdom does not fit in the hand of a fool. It's not there. His heart's not with it. Where is your heart today? Where is your heart when someone wrongs you? Where are we when it comes to serving God? 
we want to serve him faithfully to bring him glory, to bring him praise and honor in this world and to help as many souls as possible come out of the darkness of this world and the shackles of sin and to be redeemed, to be washed in the blood of the Lamb. That's what God put us here to do, to be faithful to him, to fear him, to keep his commandments. That's the whole duty of man and to help others as many as possible come to Jesus before it's too late. When we think about those things, it's going to encourage us to dig a little deeper into God's Word, spend more time meditating on His Word, and share that with others. And that's something on which we can meditate this Monday and every day. May God bless you till we meet again. Mm -hmm.